Well, hello, sports fans. This is yours truly, Miss Banker, back with you to talk about the events of World War II, uh, part one. So if we got your popcorn and ready to watch, and also a piece of paper and a pencil to take some notes. So we begin with maybe a little review. So I feel like we haven't done justice to Japan, and there's some names here that you need to know. So remember, uh, in the 1920s, Japan is becoming more democratic, right, as many nations uh, were. However, when the Great Depression hits in 1929, things get ugly, right? Just as we see in Italy and Japan, people blame the government, uh, people don't trust the government, and in this case, the military leaders take over. So we've got two things going on here. One, Emperor Hirohito, perhaps you remember him. He's part of the Meiji Restoration. So he's still there. Um, and there's not really one dictator like uh, Hitler or Mussolini, but we have then a military general, Hideki Tojo, who then becomes the prime minister uh, in Japan. So now we have the military in charge of the government. So these are two names that you'll know. But uh, strangely enough, it'll be Tojo who'll be tried for war crimes, I think, at the end of the war, um, for causing World War II, not so much Hirohito. So with the military control um, come military goals. So remember, they decide they want a Pacific Empire, which would include China, and they were a little fascist almost, like Hitler and Mussolini. So they want to control all of Asia, uh, they had a statement, Asia for the Asiatics. So they invade Manchuria, right, which we talked about in, cl in class, set up the puppet state. And then by 1937, right, here is Nanjing, sort of, uh, or at least where I think it is. And uh, so by 1937, they've taken Nanjing, and China, for the most part, is under Japanese control. So I just wanted to review that here, and I think I spoke at least to some of you about the horrors that ensue. Hopefully it's not too graphic, but it's the least graphic picture I could find of what happens in Nanjing, often called the Rape of Nanjing. So remember, Hitler's overtly disobeying the Treaty of Versailles by um, ignoring the military restrictions. He's putting the troops in the Rhineland. So here's a better map than I showed you in class. So here's the Rhineland, the buffet, buffer state. Um, they have then moved into Austria, right, for their Anschluss. Here is the Sudetenland, right? Remember, they've gone into Sudetenland, which causes um, the people to meet in Munich to talk about what the heck is going on here. Uh, remember, this is our emperor of Ethiopia that says to the League of Nations, hey, you guys are crazy. If you're not paying attention, if you're not going to stop them here in Ethiopia, then they're, you're going to be next. So, right, here we have the axis of evil, Rome and Berlin. The world's going to revolve around this. These are the countries that you need to know that are associated with the axis powers. Germany, Japan, and Italy. Look at those guys. Okay. So, after going into the Sudetenland, here is the League of Nations, not doing anything but posing for pictures. Oops. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, this is the Munich Conference, so here's our friends Mussolini, Hitler, I don't know who that is, maybe a French guy, and Neville Chamberlain. And so Never Ch Neville Chamberlain, who's the Prime Minister of Great Britain, goes back to London and says, Don't worry, folks. War is averted. We've appeased Hitler. He just wants the German people, and he's done. Famous last words. So 1939 is when it all changes. By March, even though in September of 38, Hitler's promised he just wanted Sudetenland, he invades all of Czechoslovakia. By August, remember, they shock the West when the Germans and the Soviets sign their non-aggression pact. By September, surprise. But in reality, it's surprise, right? The Germans have attacked Poland with the tactic called Blitzkrieg, right? Lightning war. And so you can see here, they throw it all at, ah, uh, stupid, sorry. This works better on my Mac. 
So they had tanks, soldiers, planes. I mean, they just go into Poland, as you can see here, with everything they got. And uh, wait till I show you pictures of Poland after the war, and you can see what happens here. So here, notice on this map, the Soviet Union then has moved in to the east, right? As courtesy of their non-aggression pact. So what to do, right? There's this time called the Phony War, or Sitzkrieg. <laughs> those Germans, hilarious, where everybody's just waiting, right? The Allies have amassed here on the Maginot Line, this fortification France builds after World War I so that the Germans will never invade again, but of course that doesn't stop them. So they, they sit around and wait. Everybody's mobilized, everybody's waiting to see who will make the next move, and of course our aggressor will do that. So by April 1940, things get real. Uh, Hitler attacks, surprise, on Denmark and Norway. They fall quickly to him by May 1940. A month later, Hitler sweeps through the Netherlands and Belgium. And by June of 1940, so think about it, the war starts in September of 39. By June of 1940, France has fallen. Look at him, right? I don't know why I love this picture. It's just the arrogance of Hitler saying, boom, there I am. There's the Eiffel Tower, and uh, France is mine. So now, I know what you're thinking. What are the British going to do? Their one and only ally has fallen. Remember, the Americans are keeping a hands-off policy here. Well, except for Roosevelt. So who's next, right? So let's like, take a look at the map here. Look carefully, OK? So we have that, oh, uh, sorry. We have the Axis powers, the dark purple, of course, don't forget about Libya here, Italian territory. Um, so by 1940, you can see in the light purple, maxim, maximum axis control. All these light purple countries then are controlled by Germany. So who's next? If you were Hitler, where would you go? Hopefully the answer is <laughs> Great Britain and the Soviet Union. But we'll talk more about these things later because they're pretty significant and in the case of Battle of Britain, kind of a romantic story of heroics in the matter of the invasion of the Soviet Union, uh, a tale of woe and awfulness. Okay, so, okay, I tried to do some editing. I hope that worked. So, the end of section one sort of talks about some things that we might not go into detail. Um, we'll probably talk a little bit more about North Africa later, but as you know, um, things are happening elsewhere, right? Because we're talking about an all-out push as Hitler's trying to control all of Europe. So he's going to rely on his uh, Italian allies to handle things in North Africa and the Balkans. But uh, what's the old joke about the, one of the shortest books in history, the book on Italian war heroes? <laughs> Burn. The Italians are not known for their military prowess, so Hitler eventually has to send his own guys down to North Africa and to the Balkans to clean up some of the Italian mistakes. So North Africa, these are Australian troops here fighting in Libya in 1941. Um, a lot of the battles in North Africa deal with tanks, and we'll talk about uh, one of the masters of this type of warfare, Rommel, a German general soon. So the British there are fighting the Germans mostly, but initially the Italians. And then I found this um, cartoon from Punch magazine in Great Britain. It's called the Balkan Web. So Hitler's going to get stuck here a little bit because you and I know he's going to gun for Soviet Union. So he wants to go in 1940, but alas, these little problems here and how the Italians didn't do their job has kind of waylaid him because he really wants to go through Eastern Europe to the Soviet Union. Um, and so he kind of gets stuck there for a while and then invades mistakenly in 1941. So we'll talk about these things later. So this is it. Uh, chapter 32, Section 1. And we'll start again later.